Thanks. Um, so, dear colleagues, first of all, thanks for having us here in this session of all. Uh, we will talk about uh, the region of development and large scale interdependencies of uh, some transferables from Northwestern Europe. Well, it's more Sasha talking about this because I'm more or less the Hallstatt culture sidekick. And we want to stress the fact that. Um, by looking on more than the objects and the performance of the burial rituals, we might get a different or at least a slightly different picture of what is happening in between uh, Central Europe and Northwestern Europe um, in primarily Karlstadt Sea. Um, these burials have mostly long been known, um, and they are made up uh, partly by finds that we normally interpret as imports from Karlstadt culture. Um, the best known example is here on the slide, uh, the Sword of Oz, um, that finds its best parallels uh, in finds from Hallstatt itself and Gomerlingen, and they testify um, interactions of some kind between Central uh, Europe, e.g. the Hallstatt culture, uh, and Northwestern Europe. Uh, but still, uh, when we look at these burials from a Central European perspective, <coughs> we normally perceive these as isolated dots in the right co uh, northwestern corner of our uh, distribution maps, um, as shown uh, with these two examples here, we have uh, the early Hallstatt dragons on the left and the sort of, sorts of the early Hallstatt cultures on the left, and we find these burials here in the northwestern corner of these um, maps, but they don't play any major role in um, discussing uh, cultural borders or aspects of social distinctions in the early Iron Age, and they are normally seen as like some objects that were being traded to the lowlands without any further contact between these two regions. And by looking at the Berber practices, um, this is the point that you want to stress in this paper that we might get a different perception of these um, contacts. Um, because in early Hallstatt period, we normally uh, see pretty regional phenomena, especially in contrast to um, <coughs> the late Bronze Age and the latter Hallstatt period um, by looking at the burial practices within the region of development, but still with a focus on large-scale interdependencies, we think that we might get a slightly different touch of what is happening in Europe. Yeah, so uh, as part of my doctorate, I have been studying these uh, burials from the low countries and I've created an inventory of them. We're dealing with about 70 uh, burials that can be described as elite or sumptuous in uh, some way. They come from burials and they come from flat graves. Uh, we're dealing with uh, cremation burials that contain weaponry, wagons, and horse gear components, um, but also bronze vessels, tools, and ornaments, and toiletry items. Sometimes we're dealing with one such elite burial on each side, sometimes we have several close together. They are almost all located in or by urn fields uh, or barrow groups. We find them on high points in the landscape, at least by Dutch standards. Um, <laughs> many of the objects that shine show signs of use. Um, and there's also quite some diversity. They range from burials with just uh, a sword or a bronze vessel to the more elaborate ones like uh, the wagon grave of Wichen, uh, shown here which is uh, relatively well known for the linchpins with Etruscan style figureheads. I want to stress though that even though we're going to be talking about the elite burials as is appropriate in such a session, um, the majority of people were buried in urn fields at this time. Uh, just to give an example, I've got about 70 burials in my catalog. My colleague Ariel Lawa is uh, currently working on his doctorate into the contemporaneous, um, for lack of a better word, normal burials. Uh, He's two years into his project, and he has tens of thousands. Thank you. Right? Yeah. 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 Okay, and he has a poster in this session, so go check it out. Um, and what we're finding is that the elite burials and the Ironfield burials really form a spectrum within the regional funerary tradition. They have shared elements in their burial practices. We find uh, use of fire, the uh, manipulation and fragmentation of both uh, grave goods and the dead, and the parse protons and deposition of both. Now, before we turn to these uh, eight burials with the house of culture imports, we just have to take a little step back into the late Bronze Age, where we find elite burials um, with bronze swords. Now, these uh, bronze swords are generally the a type. 
They're deposited, burnt, bent, and broken, sometimes incompletely. Um, and here again, the burial practice is very much in line with the urnfield burial practice. In fact, if you were to take out the bronze swords, they would be indistinguishable from all the other burials around them. Uh, interestingly enough, in terms of our scale connections, these swords are uh, all Atlantic creations. They are made uh, in the Atlantic sphere, so uh, low countries, parts of France, or southern uh, England. And it is only from the 8th century onward that we start to get these graves with clear Halsha culture imports, shown, for example, by the chieftain's burial also on the left. Um, as you can see, in terms of the grave goods they contain, they are very similar to the burial of the Halsha culture. If you compare also with uh, the fusion that was found at Sheffield, most of the objects are practically interchangeable. We've got the same kind of sword, same kind of bronze vessel, uh, ribbed drinking bowls, horse gear, yokes. Um, and uh, this set of grave goods occurs over and over again, which has led us to really suggest the idea that perhaps we're dealing also with a set idea, an idea, an idea represented by this set of grave goods that may have been shared between the Low Countries and uh, Central Europe. Now, if we go uh, in just a little bit more detail into this set of grave goods, uh, we find something interesting in the four most elaborate ones in the Low Countries. Uh, um, as you can see, most of the, or actually almost all of the grave goods in these graves are very much Halsha culture imports, with the exception of the axes. These are locally made axes, or at least regional products. They are definitely not imports from Central Europe uh, or the Halsha culture, which means that it was a local choice to add these axes to the burial set. Uh, what makes it so striking is that in the Low Countries, axes never end up in burials. They were they always kept out of the funerary tradition. Of all the burials we've inventoried from this period, these four are the only ones with axes. So someone was involved in these burial rituals uh, who, I argue, had knowledge of Central European um, burial customs, and for some reason, something about these people made it okay for them to add axes to their burial mm -hmm. set perhaps evidencing some kind of local knowledge of exotic burial rituals. Um, and we can see similarities between Southern Central Europe <coughs> and the Low Countries, even if we look far beyond the objects themselves. And we have some more case studies here. One is probably uh, the reuse of burial mounds. That is a common phenomenon in uh, Hallstatt culture that uh, for making a sumptuous burial, you use a bronze age mound and you put a new mound on top. I uh, like what we have in Frankfurt Stadtwald here, where we have three burial mound faces, and the last one is um, the grave we already saw before. And uh, strikingly, we have the same phenomenon here in Ostfürstler, where we have uh, again a Bronze Age mound, um, and that is being uh, made a lot uh, larger because of um, the burial of the early Iron Age, making up one of the largest mounds of this uh, region in Europe later on. So this might not be a coincidence also. This phenomenon is not um, only known in these two areas, but we can go on with several other aspects. We also we heard about the Passportoto that is very striking here in these countries in the lowlands, where we have uh, a set of horse here representing possibly a wagon burial. Um, and we have similar, or at least comparable ideas in Hausha culture as well. We already saw uh, the burial uh, of Mutakeshi two times today. Um, and what's quite striking here that we have this uh, burial of a woman probably on the wagon box with the oak here, but we have no trace whatsoever of um, the wheels of the wagon, but they might have been made of wood, but we do not find a single piece of horse gear. So we have a wagon burial, but it still is sort of a passport total because it's not functional because the horse gear is all missing. And even in partial culture, we could take this further uh, if we again look at Frankfurt but where we have the, the yoke and the horse gear, we do not have a single trace of the wagon. Again, you could argue that the wagon was made of wood and we do not have any traces left. That's still quite striking that there is not a single metal piece that can be seen as part of the wagon. So also in Hallstatt culture, we see um, a component of passport total of these burials that differs from these of the low countries because they are much more extreme, as we see these examples here where we have parts of a yoke uh, that was completely torn apart before parts of this find 
and others were given into the burials fragmented. But the idea behind these uh, burial rituals might indicate a shared idea. <coughs> and the same goes for the bending and folding and destru uh, destruction of other burials that Sasha mentioned, that we see some examples from the Low Countries here. And if we look closer into the burial ritual of Hallstatt culture, of early Hallstatt culture, we also see this phenomenon uh, most strikingly in the swords, where we see more than 50% of Hallstatt swords coming from burials are given into burials, broken or deliberately destroyed. So again, we have a different regional um, performance, but the underlying concept still seems to be quite connected to each other. And the most striking example is probably the wrapping of Textra that is best known in Hallstatt culture um, from the burial of Hofdorf, that is later than our burials here, and from the Glauberg of the early Latin era. But um, due to the slightly not that good state of research of early Hallstatt culture, we do not really have good examples. But if you look close enough, um, like probably the recently excavated burial of Hotzing, or others like Rap Sword of Niederau or Mitterkirchen, we still find this in the early Hallstatt period. Uh, that we have grave goods being wrapped up before they are put into the burials. And uh, most strikingly, a recent analysis made by Sasha and Katina Grumo of the textile remains of uh, the burial of um, Osho, that these um, grave goods were also wrapped in textiles before they were put into the bucket. So again, uh, in form of the grave goods that we have preserved as textiles, we see a shared burial practice between these two regions, although they are performed in a different regional manner because we have underlying different concepts, uh, different regionally um, concepts of the burial practices. Yeah, so in conclusion, we hope that we've given you some food for thought today, and we hope that we've shown that the early Iron Age sumptuous graves of the Low Countries are very well situated in the regional burial practice. Um, we see shifting connections from the during transition from the Late Bronze Age to the Early Iron Age, while the Late Bronze Age seems to be very much connected to the Atlantic sphere. There's no uh, material evidence of contact with Hallstatt culture. In the Early Iron Age, we see this clear shift in focus and uh, quite a large influx of Hallstatt culture objects. Um, the objects, however, are treated in a local manner in the uh, regional burial ritual, but the burial rituals also seem to express or at least reflect Halsted culture customs. Um, both of the elite burials of the Low Countries and the Halsted culture uh, are the results of burial practices involving breaking and bending of objects in the grave goods, uh, cross dozo, wrapping in textiles, and the reuse of burial mounds. So we argue that perhaps we're dealing with more than just objects that are traveling across uh, Europe at this time in Hallstatt Sea. Perhaps we're also seeing shared ideas. So uh, in our opinion, it is time to reconsider the trans-European connections in Hallstatt Sea between the Low Countries and Central Europe. Thank you very much. <laughs>